Okay, good evening everyone. Um, thank you for waiting. If you were in the waiting room for a few minutes there, a uh, previous event over around, so we're just a little bit, a um, couple of minutes behind. Um, but yeah, good evening. I'm Dr Jenny Gilbert, coordinator of the Black Country Studies Centre, and thank you all so much for joining us this evening for the first in a series of lectures celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Festival of Britain. The Festival of Britain launched on the 4th of May 1951, so this was the kind of closest date we could get to that um, to, to sort of launch this season. So the festival theme season is a collaboration between Black Country Studies Centre and Artsfest Online. And it arose from some research being done by Black Country Living Museum into the Festival of Britain in the Black Country. And based on that, people were reaching out to kind of academics at the university in the School of Art in particular um, to see if there was any kind of expertise there. And it turns out there was. <laughs> um, and if you visit the Black Country Living Museum over the next couple of months following its reopening on the 17th of May, you'll be able to experience a little taste of the festival in the Folks Park area where they've kind of recreated a little festival of the Black Country. Um, so to set the scene and to introduce the festival, this evening we are joined by Dr Jane Webb, Deputy Head of the University of Wolverhampton School of Art. Um, Jane trained in art history and anthropology and has worked in art schools teaching design history and theory to designers and artists for over 25 years. Jane's research is mainly into fashion and dress, though she frequently forays into broader design history especially to one of her favourite topics, the Festival of Britain, which luckily is what she's going to be talking to us about tonight. A couple of kind of boring housekeeping matters before we go any further. Please note that this session is being recorded so that if, an, if you want to catch up on the um, Arts Fest Online YouTube channel, you'll be able to do so. But please, if you do share any questions or any um, comments, please don't share any personal details when you do so. Also, um, if you do have any questions that you wish to, to put to Jane, please pop them in the Q&A box um, available at the bottom of your screens. And we should have hopefully 10, 15 minutes at the end of the session to, to go through some of those. Um, also, I'll be share, sharing a link in the chat that will take you to more information about the um, festival season. We have our next event taking place on Monday the 17th at 5.30 p.m., which is with the wonderful Naomi Gaines, daughter of the late and great graphic designer Abraham Gaines, who was something of a, a kind of key figure in creating the visual identity of the festival. I'm sure Jane will perhaps cover some of that in her talk. So without further ado, and um, to introduce the Festival of Britain and to launch this very special season, it is a great pleasure to hand you over to Dr Jane Webb. Great, thanks Jen, um, and welcome everyone. Yes, I'm going to provide the backdrop really, and given you a backdrop as well, um, of the Festival of, um, of Britain. And I'm going to do it by looking at the beginnings of the festival, um, the London sites, which will be a counterpoint really to the regional history that we'll be looking at later on in the series. Um, the visual language, or probably I should say visual languages of the festival. And I thought I'd do a section around the critical thinking of the festival. Every time there is an anniversary of any kind, it's looked at in a different way. And I think that's what makes it so relevant. It has lots of ways of looking at it. So I'm going to finish off um, thinking about different ways of uh, addressing the festival. Sorry, my festival guidebook's just fallen on the floor. Um, and um, really hopefully help introduce the series. Okay, so the beginnings. Um, the festival really began um, as an idea in 1943 when the Royal Society of Arts approached the government. Um, it was meant to be about uh, commemorating the 1851 Great Exhibition of the Industry of All Nations. Um, and it seemed to be a really good idea at the time, but obviously 1943, there's quite a lot going on, as you can imagine, with the Second World War. And around 1945, it got picked up again um, by um, Gerald Barry, who essentially was a, a news editor. And he produced or created sort of ideas around the festival about it being a tonic to the nation. And that's where the phrase comes from. 
Um, later, when the Labour government had taken over in 1945, it was 1947 um, that Herbert Morrison Lord Festival um, announced that there would be a slightly pared down festival. The relationship to the original idea, the um, great exhibition of the industry of all nations was very vague. Um, and really one could look at the two festivals quite in opposition. The great exhibition of the industry of all nations was a stage set for lots of nations to show their industry coming all together. The Festival of Britain was rather an insular festival. Um, and the reason I've got the guidebook here is it tells a story and it suggests that the story is, it's not about a museum of British culture. It's not a trade show of British wares. It tells the story of British contributions to world civilization in the arts of peace. So an interesting um, idea. And of course it's set against really worrying events like the Korean War, which began in 1950 and massive economic deprivation. There was still a lot of rebuilding to do of Britain. So in some ways it's, it's a miracle really that the festival carried on and it's often put down to the fervor of Herbert Morrison. Um, there's lots of precedents, but I think that um, one of the key things to um, connect to the festival was the Britain Can Make It exhibition, which was at the V&A. Not only did it have a lot of the same designers and architects um, taking part in that as the festival, but it really did establish the connection between art and design and building a new and better future. So it essentially was a show that showed 3,000 um, pieces of manufacture that combined innovation with brilliant design and was essentially attempting to develop design consciousness. One could be cynical and say consumerism um, in the British public, but it had lots of similar devices such as these room settings. In terms of an intellectual precedent, I think that sense that art and design was of use to society that could change society for, for the good has really emerged through an earlier um, group of artists and designers called the Artists International Association. And that had been founded amongst other people by Misha Black, who was very important and a, a major designer of the Festival of Britain. And they were really keen to promote the relationship between art and life and to see art and design as a crucial part of society and politics and an, an armory really, if, if you can say that for peace, uh, about, against fascism, against colonial oppression. And um, this on the left is an exhibition that was in 1943, um, The Freedom for Liberty, um, it was exhibited in a bombed out John Lewis um, shop and really it was an epitome of the sort of projects that the AIA did. And Misha Black and um, Henry went on to do the work in the Festival of Britain. So there is an underlying sense of the, the work that art and design can do for good. In terms of Britishness and I think we'll have to say Englishness as well. There is also a precedent in um, a project called Recording Britain, which was established during the war by Sir Kenneth Clark, who was the director of the National Gallery at the time. And he really promoted employment for artists to record sites of Britishness or Englishness, not there wasn't many, um, visions of Wales and Scotland, I think none at all of Scotland. It was recorded on a different scheme entirely um, and certainly not Northern Ireland. But you can see that he was really keen that artists would use paint, would use drawing, because he felt that those evoked the genius loci, that the sense of presence of Englishness, of Britishness in these sites, and that had to be recorded. So there is a sense that 
Britain has been looked at as something that has a, a quality and essence that has already found a visual language in it. And um, Barbara Jones was also part of the scheme. Her interest was perhaps in more popular culture and we'll see her a little bit more through the talk. Um, and this is a fantastic example of that. She published a lot of articles in Architectural Review, which then led on to a book called The Unsophisticated Arts. So there is a sense that this language of what is Britain at that point was emerging through these earlier projects. And I suppose finally what I would say is that the mass observation project was also important because it was about um, a sense of recording ordinary life but lots of people's perspective on it. So there was a fascination by um, the people that established mass observation, Tom Harrison, Charles Madge and Humphrey Jennings, that there could be some way of establishing a kind of spirit of the crowd around major events and a festival was just such an event. Um, Humphrey Jennings, I think, died in 1950, but he did make a film for the festival um, called Family Portrait, I think. So moving on to London sites. Um, I'm talking about the many sites in London. I'd love to talk much more about them. There were lots and lots of different exhibitions. So I've just picked out a couple really. Um, Black Eyes and Lemonade is I think a very important exhibition. It was curated by Barbara Jones and was full of the sorts of things that she was fascinated by, which were popular culture. So there were pub signs, there was advertising, there was strange kitsch fireplaces from the 1930s, all sorts of things that perhaps wouldn't fit normally in a museum or gallery. And I'm, I think that went on to inspire a lot of younger artists who became what we might know as pop art um, to really explore visual language and popular culture. And then you had things like this, which was at the v &A. it was the book design uh, exhibition. And I show that because of the amazing exhibition design, which was really challenging and exciting in the Festival of Britain um, all the way around it. Another important site in London was the Battersea Park um, Pleasure Gardens. And the Pleasure Gardens was this confection really of fantasy buildings. Um, it was designed by Charles Gardner largely, but alongside people like Osbert Lancaster, who was a cartoonist and a scholar, a, a, an architectural historian. And um, they were, as you can see, these crazy combinations of sort of Baroque architecture alongside fairground architecture all mixed up together and real fantasy. And it was meant to be almost an antidote to the South Bank, which was a much more serious and um, educational experience. This was about pleasure. It had grottos, it had dancing figures, actors, um, it had tree walks um, and this really strange railway. What I think is fascinating about that area of London was that it was literally drawings come to life, fantasy drawings. Um, Roland Emmett was very famous for creating the Punch cartoon, um, which was the far tottering and Oyster Creek branch railway, which was actually created for the Battersea Park Pleasure Gardens. And this is one of Osbert Lancaster's drawings um, from his book, Pillar to Post, which shows some of these same architectural structures that you saw in the previous image. Another site, before I get to the, the, the main one, was this um, Lansbury Poplar site, which was a planning, a kind of dream of planning, really. It was modern architecture. It was that elevation that modern architecture rose you away from the ruins, away from the past, into a new, brighter future that was clean, that was modern, that was efficient. Um, and there was an exhibition set up by this new housing estate to really explore the contrast between a suburban life that wasn't really about modernity. It was a kind of, they had this sort of 
pretend thing called Gremlin Grange, which basically looked like lots of 1930s suburban houses with a bit of Elizabethan styling on it. Um, and basically they contrasted that with the um, new future of the, this modernist architecture. So there were lots of different sites that were all connected to this idea of the festival. And um, of course, the main one was the South Bank site. Now, the organisers planned the South Bank to have a narrative, as I read out to you. This was about Britain's contribution to the arts of peace. And there was actually a way to go around the festival, although if you notice, it does say, well, you can go to each pavilion individually, it's OK. Actually, what's interesting is that once I show you around the site, I think you'll think, blimey, I, I don't think I could actually manage to go around this in a day. It looks really comprehensive and lots and lots of things to look at. So I'm going to take you around the way that they planned. And it started off with, you went through this um, aluminium cone entrance, which was colored red inside, white on the outside, almost like a triumphal arch. Um, and you entered into um, the earth, the, the land of Britain. Um, this moved into the natural scene, the country pavilion, and then this pyramid shape, which you can just see um, on the right, is um, the minerals of the, of the earth, of the island. And what's interesting is that you're starting off, and they do say this in the guidebook, with the book of nature. And there is a very um, modernist approach to this. It's about stripping the resources that we've got and utilizing them. It, it feels very much about these raw materials that then get shaped by this heroic group of people. What I'm interested in as well is that this is called Minerals of the Island. And it has this very insular sense that Britain is this island very much isolated, quite different from its previous experience of being part of this massive world war and of course of an empire. You moved on to um, the power and production pavil pavilion. Um, and this is essentially changing um, the raw materials into something that can be forged and, and help make things. And then you moved into the sea and ships pavilion. So again, natural um, energy being utilized and kind of um, conquered, if you like, through these amazing ships. And then you went to transport, um, which equally had the same use of raw materials. You've got this amazing train that's right outside, this, this uh, steam train. Um, and then finally to the iconic building that you've probably seen before called the Dome of Discovery, which was um, created by Ralph Tubbs. And it was a tensile structure, so it had this shifting sense, it, it moved with the wind. And inside it had lots of different um, displays such as the sky, the sea, the land, real elemental ideas. And essentially it was promoting the innovation, the exploration of the polar region, for example, the sky, the weather. So again, it was really thinking about the role of human beings, especially British human beings, in essentially establishing and kind of understanding the natural world and, and possibly conquering it as well. The other thing that was on that side, and that was called the upstream side of the festival, was um, a thing called the Skylon. Now the Skylon was actually um, a sculpture. It was an engineering sculpture, a real synergy between art and engineering. And it was named, and I had to write her name down, by Margaret Shepherd Fiddler, who named it the Skylon. It had been called all sorts of things. Um, and I think I've got a commemorative uh, Festival of Britain scarf on actually, and it's called the Sky Pointer on this. So I think um, they must have thought, oh damn, when she called it the Skylon, because um, it was, you know, a new name and a good name. So that was the upstream section, and it had a very strong narrative to it. 
perhaps less um, clear was the section that was the downstream section. Um, and this side had um, things to do with the people of Britain. So you had the people of Britain, the Lion and Unicorn Pavilion, which had a lot to do with the arts and crafts, sort of things like um, creating straw dollies, doing narrowboat painting, sort of folk art, and also the language of English, which was in this pavilion, very whimsical pavilion. And then you had this um, homes and gardens pavilion. This is the one with the pattern on one side. And that was more like the Britain can make it, slightly less um, didactic. It had lots of room settings and it essentially set up the, the notion of, of life in the present or perhaps the near future through good design. And then finally, there was the new schools um, part of this, which is a very dramatic building. Then you got to really quite sort of odd bits of canopies and quite not so clear building. And this was the sports um, pavilion, the top one, and then you had the seaside pavilion. And then you had a number of other bits and pieces of architecture, including the one piece that was remained on the site, which was the shot tower. Obviously, the major architectural part of the downstream section with its rather hazy narrative was the Royal Festival Hall, which is the only building that still exists. And it, it mirrors the, in scale, the Dome of Discovery. But as you can see, it had a much more perforated struck sort of exterior at that point. It's been renovated to be, look much more solid, but it related to these temporary but interestingly perforated in themselves architectural spaces around it. So in a sense, that brings me to the visual languages that um, exist and, and of which there are many in the festival. Um, obviously, modern architecture is a major one. And I love this uh, image. It's an image that comes from Architects Journal from 1951. And it, it calls in a rather understated way, the architecture is being most exciting. But you can see it's using very lightweight materials to create these really um, light, airy looking structures, very exciting sculptural structures. There wasn't really anything particularly English about it. It was very continental. It was modern architecture that had been done elsewhere. And I think often the festival is understood to be a, an English version of contemporary, but people have disputed that. Essentially, they just say, well, it was used in a context that made it feel slightly more vernacular. Examples of that are something like this with these suspended walkways and stairs, and they give you a sense of something like a pier as depicted by um, Barbara Jones. The other thing that comes out of the festival is the synergy between architecture, art, um, sculpture, murals, the space around buildings, garden spaces, really important sense of the unity of the arts in an urban environment. That's a major part of the festival. An obvious other visual language in the festival is the molecular language. This was chosen by the festival um, pattern design group as being a key currency really. Molecular science was seen as being a very British dominated science and it provided it, all sorts of methods by which to create unity in the site itself. And these screens were used in lots of different places. This is um, the screen on the right is a very obviously molecular screen, um, but the one on the left, which is canvas, and I think it uses angle poise springs actually to, to make them, um, they're sort of tethered. Um, is probably slightly less obvious, but it's this principle of having a set of components that then builds a bigger thing, seems to be a, a big theme across the um, site. 
this is another example of a site in, in London, but you can see how it's much more obvious um, for the Science Museum. Uh, this is the Science Museum screen, this amazing screen. Um, and also you had wallpaper, which was drawn from things like boric acid and insulin. I think this one's insulin. Um, the, um, the picture on the left, I really think is interesting because you've got this amazing modern screen and yet you've got this car at the front that looks terribly, third, well, 20s even. And there's something about this type of design that feels very modern even now. And it's quite a shock to see this historic um, vehicle. Quite in, in great contrast are things like these folk arts that were very much part of the festival as much as the molecular design. Um, and really in opposition to it, they were rather quaint. And again, it's this language of Britain as a slightly eccentric place that isn't quite used to foreigners. It, it, it's quite a different placement of Britain as this island, slightly befuddled island, um, as opposed to its position in a, as a kind of world power. Um, and, and that comes through a lot in the festival. Um, this is another example. Um, this is the work on country fairs by Barbara Jones. And again, you have that sense of fairs and merry-go-rounds and these almost traditional popular culture arts that, that perpetuates again around the site. This is the country pavilion. And finally, I think the, the key visual language underlying all of this is actually Scandinavian design. Um, there was a really influential exhibition in 1930 and it carried on being incredibly influential. Um, Heels had um, a, an exhibition concurrent with the festival and um, you can see that the room settings have this combination of natural materials, a sort of truth to natural materials, a relationship with the natural world, but these lovely modern, light, very stylish um, pieces of furniture that, that sit easily with this natural, um, the notion of natural materials. And um, one commentator said, um, instead of all hells broken loose on the South Bank, all heels broken loose on the South Bank, because it was, you know, suffuse with all this heel style furniture, Scandinavian furniture. So there's a strange set of visual languages. It, it is very continental, it's very international as a style, yet there is this underlying sense of an insularity um, and a sense of Britishness, as I said, is this slightly befuddled island. Anyway, that, that brings me to the final section. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, and it's the critical thinking about the festival. And I think it's, as I said, it's always important to do that. I, I called this talk um, revisiting a tonic to the nation because it's not just about the festival itself, but it's about the ways in which it's been looked at a number of times before. I'm just looking around at my books. So A Tonic to the Nation um, is the 25th um, anniversary. It was published in 1976 and begins to look critically at the festival itself. So I want to draw out some themes that might be of interest um, for the future really of thinking about the festival, but also about the, the talks and the regional um, festivals that we're going to talk about, festival events we're going to talk about. Now, the, the really obvious impact of the festival is through its design and its modern design. And um, the, as Jen was saying, it, this amazing symbol, um, it's, it really did set a whole period of design in Britain off. And we'll be looking at lots of examples of that in later talks. Um, but I think the, the design um, research unit was established by Misha Black in 1943 before the, the festival. 
but the festival was almost the catalyst to show the potential for that combination of amazing graphics with these amazing urban spaces and how you move people through spaces. Um, and the design research unit went on to be a really key player in designing the cities of the future really and the way that cities and the railways are organized and are identified and, and read by people in an urban environment. So I think it's really clear that as Hugh Casson suggests in a brilliant film called A Brief City, there is literally a blueprint for building in Britain and somewhere like Coventry is a classic example of how that then became the future of building in this in um, the UK. In by by 1976, some of the leading architects in the Festival of Britain had really begun to question whether it was good or bad architecture that was being created in the name of festival style. Um, and of course, I suppose that is inevitable that there might be um, ideas and um, principles that begin to be watered down over time. Just with a sense of where we are at the moment in society, the other thing I want to say in terms of the legacy and maybe critical thinking about the exhibition is how accessible this type of architecture is for everybody. It almost requires you to be youthful, to be fit, to be able to run up and down these sort of um, suspended walkways and different levels. There is a physical type of citizen that is implicated in this kind of building. And I think one might argue that accessibility has remained and still remains a problem for our cities because it clearly isn't here. This is a modern architecture, but it's a modern architecture for only some people. It's an architecture of the future of tomorrow for only some people. So if we're thinking about the festival, then we have to think about how it define certain types of citizen um, and certain types of urban environment. I want to, I suppose, also suggest that I think why designers and artists love the, sorry, that's my watch, um, loved, the, loved the Festival of Britain as a, a moment is because it is about this synergy between innovation, engineering, art and design, the complete work of art, but the complete work of science as well. What seems to have happened in the last 70 years is the decoupling of science and engineering with art and design. Why is that? How did that happen? Um, and I put this image, which was a very um, controversial image, um, that came from the government uh, quite recently, you, you might remember, that seems to suggest the arts are somehow on the outskirts of what we do in society. And of course, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the arts and design were seen as very much crucial to providing not only solutions to society, but also to be able to evoke the presence, the qualities of the place that we live in. So it seems strange to me to think how from Britain can make it, um, which we still think Britain can make it perhaps, but how we've moved and shifted to this relationship with art that seems to put it on the outskirts. Did this begin to happen through a very strange quality, a very strange discourse that emerged out of the festival in which the design, this molecular, this rather um, ethereal one could almost say, this, this architecture of balance, this design of balance, um, it, was, it began to be called terms like effeminate. And 
there were even suggestions that if you're anything to do with the Council of Industrial Design, there was an effeminacy about it and suggestions of, you know, designers dressing in effeminate ways. So there is a really strange discourse that emerges in the 1940s um, post-war, lots of homosexual men begin to, in, in high places, begin to get prosecuted at that point, Alan Turing being one of those um, examples. So there's something about this kind of sense that this isn't masculine architecture and design, and it's effeminate, it's whimsical, there's something negative about it. I think for a critical eye to look at this um, as something in the past, that, that strikes me as quite an interesting aspect of the way the design was received and the way society at the time was thinking about qualities that perhaps could be connected to notions of sexuality and design. The role of women, the role of women in the festival. Depressingly, there aren't that many female architects used, artists, designers, um, and women are depicted in the festival in quite kind of odd ways, in classed ways as well. So you have the honest working woman depicted, but also there's this kind of aspirational, perhaps upper working class, um, kind of leisured middle class depictions in some of these images, um, which sit at odds really to the modernity of this architecture. Um, and I'm, I was quite struck, it's, it's a slightly odd um, connection, but 10 years later, there was a book called The English Inside Out by Pearl Binder. And, and Pearl Binder was one of the artists that established the Artists International Association. And there's a really sort of odd chapter at the end called God, the English and the H-bomb, in which she essentially suggests that there are women who somehow maintain a quality of Englishness, Britishness that has to be held on to, and that they lead the way in essentially looking at what's going on in society, and particularly in the anti-nuclear movement. Now I include this because I think it's an interesting shift almost to say there's this sort of these figures of women who are depicted rather than seem active, it seems, in, in the festival. And, and later on, there's, an art, uh, there's a writer who's trying to identify a role that women might have that is very English. She, she talks about um, the English is not having lost their dotty calm. Um, and is this a value in the world today? Well, yes, she believes it is, and that's how the book ends. So there's something about women being a guardian, perhaps of action or inaction or, or kind of opposition that appears later, but doesn't appear at the time in the festival or so it seems from a historical perspective, looking back. Now, obviously you could go further and think about our, our society um, of today and, the only faces of colour in the guide of the festival are pictured in this imperial leather advert, which sits at odds with the emergence of um, the Commonwealth, which was emerging through the 1930s and 40s, out of the empire. Um, there was very little associated with the Commonwealth at all at the Festival of Britain. There was an exhibition at the, the Imperial Institute, which tried to establish a language about the Commonwealth that was about shared resources and shared heritage. And yet the main site was really very absent. It was, it was still this very white, befuddled kind of Islander story that appeared um, in the Festival of Britain. And really the only presence given the 
a kind of backdrop of Windrush, the only presence in the festival was a self-funded Trinidad um, all steel percussion orchestra who were determined to visit the Festival of Britain and to play steel drums and raise the money and did it themselves. They're incredibly popular um, on the site, but really there was no other sense of the Commonwealth that existed on the site. Even food was British pr produced. There wasn't foreign food on the site. And it made me think about some of the rhetoric of the festival and the notions of Englishness that rather, as I said, befuddled Islander. And when you read somehow things like this, which was produced by the BBC, and it talks about, you know, ways to think about the English and how to prepare yourself. And it does say things like, well, you know, English like to queue and don't forget the weather is always terrible. So there's elements that are, are, are coming from the festival that somehow filter into an approach which essentially makes people from the Commonwealth very much as other, that they are not connected to Englishness. And of course, we know where that leads. Slightly worrying, um, but I don't think was actually part of the festival itself as it happened in October. The Ku Klux Klan also did a procession in the um, park, uh, Battersea Park Gardens, um, which essentially suggests that there was a sense that that was a comfortable place to go and do that sort of thing. So perhaps we're inheriting a legacy that the Festival of Britain was part of there. I've got a couple more thoughts really. One is about politics and goodness knows that's a difficult thing to think about at the moment. But the festival was in this interesting pocket of uh, a Labour government, having been um, decided by a coalition government, uh, you know, politicians on all sides of the House. But um, it's often portrayed as this moment of the left. And, um, and, and what's interesting about the moment of the left is that that period from 1945 to 1951 is incredibly important still to us today. Just have to write a list the Education Act, the National Health Service, the National Insurance, um, the New Towns Act, Town and Country Planning Act, and plans for nationalisation, all established in a very brief period of time. And it reminds me of a period from the, 19, from the 1830s when a, a small group of politicians driven by sort of Benthamite politics did a lot of policy changing at that point. And what I'm interested in is what happens when you change policies, you change the shape of things, and then you, the, the power shifts and you're left with these structures. This is a, an article by Michael Frayne, which was written in 1961 and reprinted here in The Guardian um, in 2001. And, um, sorry, 1963 it was written originally. And he talks about this, um, Festival of Britain as the triumph of the herbivores, these left-wing intellectuals versus the carnivores, everybody else. Um, and I don't think it's as simple as that, but I think the festival comes at a moment that begins to sort of provide a, a, an idea about the state and the citizen um, that is still a question for us today. Michael Frayne in his article suggests that the festival was the final end of the rainbow and somehow I connected it to uh, some of the discourse around the current period in terms of how we think about the NHS for instance. And finally um, I wanted just of course to introduce the question of the regional versus the centre. Um, this was a question always in the Festival of Britain this wonderful symbol, as uh, Jen says, which was designed by Abraham Gaines, and you'll hear a lot more about that, uh, was designed on a compass to suggest all parts of the festival. Uh, there was a boat that went around the coast called the Campania, I can never remember what it was called, ship, which had an exhibition on it. 
There was also a land exhibition, which you can see this hunting scene um, from, from there, which was designed by Richard Levin, um, which went to Manchester first and the big cities. Um, and as we know, Pete, well, as we will find out, people had lots of regional events. Um, but there is still, I think, a question about how the centre in um, London uh, works with the rest of the British Isles. Um, and for the festival, that was also an interesting question. Um, my mother, who uh, I was very excited to find a letter that she'd written to my father um, with a Festival of Britain stamp on it. And I said, oh, Festival of Britain. So you know, she actually worked at Beatty's at the time and Beatty's had an exhibition. Um, she couldn't remember a thing about it. And so there's an interesting um, sense really perhaps that, that did this festival really touch everywhere in Britain? And I'm sure that's one of the things that we'll be looking at as well. Well, just on time, that's it from me. Um, so I hope you've got a sense of some of the things that the festival offers for us to think about. Great, thank you so much for that, Jane. <laughs> That was utterly brilliant. Um, Thank you. I guess my first question to start off, if you do want to post any questions in the Q&A, everyone's quite quiet this evening. Um, do you have any questions for Jane? <laughs> Probably I'm doing too much talking. <laughs> no, just right. Um, for me, it's there's two questions really. Firstly, what was the kind of presence of clothing and fashion in the exhibition? Oh, that's an interesting one. Do you know, I was asking myself of, of that earlier on. I don't know, to be honest. I don't know about it. Do you? Um, well, being a festival of Britain nerd, I've got my um, oh, land you've got one as well. catalogue here. Yeah. And the bit for the fashion is they, they haven't got the information in time for printing. So you've got really detailed <laughs> listings for everything except for the fashion. Um, so I'm just really interested. I don't, I don't know London. I do know Manchester and Platt Hall had a big exhibition. Um, which was playing around with the fashion of 1851 and 1951. So there was there was that sort of interplay. I, so I know of that exhibition, but I don't know of anything um, in on the main site. I mean, I'm sure there was, um, and of course there were souvenirs of of you know uh, of the festival as well. So. Yeah, someone else might know about that, but embarrassingly, that's the bit I don't know about, and it's my usually my specialism. So, All right, we've just had a question come in. Um, so this is from Dan. Thanks, Jane. Fantastic talk. Have any of the exhibits survived? Obviously, the Royal Festival Hall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. You should say that. I actually have another slide. I found a bit of the. <laughs> I found a bit of the uh, exhibit. Um, that wasn't set up, was it, Dan? Um, <laughs> it, it's um, a part of the Country Year exhibition. And I got this in Bewley some years ago, um, and uh, which is an auto jumble. But that is, there are some sites that show different survivals. So obviously a lot of the um, sculpture survived and that went to, to other places. So it, it, there was a mural that went to a school. Um, interestingly, I do know that, for example, for things that were in the home and garden section, um, I used to work with um, Polly Bins, who's a textile artist and her father, I think David Bins actually um, was one of the architects and, and designers in the festival. And she did sleep in the bunk beds with her sister from the festival for a lot of her childhood. So I think basically lots of things were demolished. The Skylon was taken apart um, and things were just generally dispersed, but there isn't a lot of anything. You'll find a lot of very crumbling antelope chairs um, which exist around and about the place, um, but very little other thing 
I don't think. I mean, there might be, but that that's my only find. Yeah. From a, uh, one of the objects I really want to track down is a ceramic porcupine made by the Wolverhampton-based sculptor Basil Matthews. Oh wow! He had a, he had a ceramic porcupine featured <laughs> in it, which <laughs> just sounds absolutely delightful. Um, but I can't even find a picture of it online. So if anyone no. knows the locations of any ceramic porcupines, please let me know. Uh, you've you've given me a challenge now. <laughs> so that's, yeah, I, I'm just trying to think um, that I do not know much of anything. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of the architects took bits of the festival, but what happened to it after that, I don't know. But it, I mean, there is a suggestion that the site was kind of quite happily demolished by the Conservative government. You know, they were quite keen to get rid of it. Um, but I think, I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure about the Labour Conservative opposition. I think it's been overplayed perhaps a little bit in terms of that. Just had a, a comment here from Jackie. My mother-in-law was training to be a teacher in London. She's now 88 and says so she and her friend could not afford to go into the exhibition. She just gave me a souvenir teapot that she bought, which sounds wonderful, Jackie. Yeah. Um, but that idea of, you were talking about kind of physical accessibility, but people had to pay to see this yes. exhibition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, everything was paid. Um, I mean, there are prices. Uh, this, I mean, the guide is pretty expensive. I mean, that's two and six, the guide. Um, but yeah, everything had, um, you know, tickets to enter. In fact, there's a story about the um, royal family, not the British royal family. I think they were the Norwegian royal family or another country. I'm sorry, I, d I don't remember the, the country exactly. And the, the ticket person would not let them through without them paying. So it's really embarrassing. They had to sort of find, you know, scrabble around to find this money. But yeah, I mean, it was, it must have been a real money spinner because you had to pay an awful lot to go into the Dome of Discovery, for example. So each one had its its own fee as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think it ever actually got close to obviously it must have been very expensive to build breaking even yeah it, it, it was actually i mean apparently there are eight million visitors um that i think it did have a quite a small budget and actually it met the budget slightly under the budget weirdly so i suspect it did make some money but um yeah I, i'm not too sure about that either actually gosh you're asking really difficult questions i don't know yeah so I'm just messaged again to say how many people attended but you answered the question yeah it's about eight million yeah which um, yeah is that a lot at the time I'm not sure really but of course that I mean I say of course but there was the Korean War you know there was the, the hope that people come from America a lot more so I think about four London buses were sent across onto the continent to advertise it um, but yeah, there was this strange attitude to the Commonwealth countries and, you know, there wasn't really that presence visible there and surely that that would have changed things. But um, yeah. yeah, that story about the drummers from Trinidad actually is really interesting that they had to they were invited to go, but they had to fund themselves. They had to collect. Yes. Them. It was a yeah. really big deal for them. It was, I think yeah. it was a wonderful BBC Four documentary on iPlayer at the moment that tells their story. Oh, is there? Right. Well, so um yeah. yeah it's it's a really uh, the, the attitude towards these commonwealth nations it, it seems quite ambivalent and, and quite almost sort of erasing them in in some respects i guess well i think there was a difficult it was a difficult situation because you're, you're stepping from empire to commonwealth supposedly this even-handed approach but there's still this sense that england's the mother country and you know, we're the ones with the children, you know, and and the I think the exhibition that was in the Imperial Institute was very much about England or Britain showing these um, kind of ways of, you know, using technology. It was still very, still very unequal um, relationship, really. Just another couple of comments in the chat. So from Charlotte, my mom has just given me a whole mass of objects and documents that belonged to my grandparents before, during and after the war. So I shall keep an eye out whilst I create yes. my inventory. 
thumbs up to that um, thorough approach to, to family documents as well, Charlotte. I like it. Yeah. Um, and from Jackie, I assume this is um, talking in relation to kind of the cost and the financial accessibility of the, of the festival, maybe. Um, perhaps more general, does it say something about the social background of successful artists at that time? It says a lot at that time, I think, yes. I mean, there was, you know, there was a very much a, a, a very strong middle class sort of, you know, culture. Um, reading reading the articles about the the architects and how they put all this together, it's very, oh, we went to the Strand, hotel on the Strand. We spent all night, you know, it feels very like that, really. Um, you, and I mean, that that is the nature of that, you know, English society at that point. And, and so I think the Michael Frayne comment that it's the herbivores, he actually does expand on that. Um, and describes them as the, the middle class elite, the do-gooders. <laughs> so yeah okay we've got one more question here from Maureen the restriction of Britain to England seems strange to us now but presumably was a feature of the period but did it at least acknowledge natural resources such as Welsh slate from other parts of Britain I think yes it did in the festival I think the it's interesting isn't it because there's always this slippage between Britain and English, you know, the British and the English. And there's a brilliant film called A Brief City, which uh, basically Hugh Casson is the main, um, the main architect for the big, the site. He has the overview of it all. And he keeps slipping between British and English all the time. But yeah, I mean, there was a recognition of slate. There was, there was recognition of all those mineral resources, really. Um, but uh, that's it's kind of colonial idea, isn't it? To, to recognise the resources, but not really the culture that comes with it, perhaps. Okay, thank you for that question, Maureen. Um, have we got any more questions or comments for Jane? Uh, so we've got a comment in from Moya. Thank you for a fascinating and insightful talk. My granddad oh. visited the festival as part of a work trip. Oh. He worked in an engineering factory in engineering in a factory in the Black Country. Ah, oh, interesting. I mean, I would say I, I have because I suppose one of the reasons why I said, well, I'm normally, you know, I'm normally looking at dresses and sort of pursuing the history of those. So but obviously I encounter a lot the Festival of Britain in my teaching but in my over the past I have come across people who've said oh my aunt went to the Festival of Britain and I have asked them to really take care of those photographs and look after them because what's quite interesting I'm sure Jen you'll you'll agree with this is that relatively recent history is very easily lost and 70 years sounds a lot to us I mean you know but actually it's quite recent history and I think without those personal photographs there is no real record of um you know what people saw and did so all you end up with is the official story of the festival rather than the things that people really looked at and what they found interesting. So I would say as a plea to everybody, you know, and maybe use the Black Country Study Centre as, as a site if there is things that you want to talk about or record or hand in, it would be great really to hear much more about everyday people's experience of the festival. Definitely. And uh... I think that's it for the questions now, um, Jane. And Moya's point really leads me on to that connection between the Black Country and the Festival of Britain. The fact that Moya's grandfather worked for an engineering firm in the Black Country, I think is very pertinent there. This kind of connection, you were saying earlier about the sciences, engineering and the arts being separated. It wasn't the case then. So whether someone was an apprentice or it was this idea that you could go and look at this demonstration of art and it was, part of what you did it was part of your identity as an engineer as well um so 
we're going to be looking at those connections with the between the festival and the black country kind of as the season progresses um so the link to the festival website i've just posted that in the chat um the naomi games talk is happening on monday 5 30 till 6 30 pm and that'll give you a much more in-depth look at the festival visual identity and the graphic design of the festival as well there's some lovely comments coming in here, Jane, as well, okay. um, from very happy attendees. Oh, good. Um, so, yes, we more events will be going live in the next week or so as well. We've got events happening every month, really, um, between now and September. They will be online, but we do have a kind of a plan emerging that we'll be doing something in real life um, yes. later in the summer as well. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for coming along and thank you in particular very much. to Jane for that wonderful talk as well. Um, so thank you. I hope to see you all at the next lecture and everyone stay safe and have a lovely rest of the evening.